Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Everybody, welcome back to the ever humbly and originally named Pat Flynn Show. I am joined today by a brand new acquaintance of mine, but somebody I'm very much looking forward to have a conversation with, Eric Robinson. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So um, I think a good amount of our conversation will just be kind of a well, get to know each other type of thing, but you have a really mm-hmm. interesting story. So I want to unpack that and kind of see where it leads. You are, as you've just uh, informed me, a, a uh, somebody who who's converted to the Catholic faith. So very cool. I can, I yep. can resonate with that. Um, coming from, uh, you know, a, a sort of Protestant background. So a different angle than, than what I came in, but what I'm very interested in exploring. So let's start, you know, let's go back. Let's kind of, let's start with some of the background info. Uh, you know, um, give us the, you know, the sort of minimum effective, if you will, uh, biography of, of Eric Robinson. And we'll just kind of, you know, dive into whatever seems interesting as you move along. That sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so I was baptized in first grade with my whole family. So that was kind of a cool experience. Mm-hmm. I don't remember much of that. Um, it was in a Presbyterian church in Michigan, actually. Um, but I was born in Texas and grew up in Texas and moved back to Texas after. <laughs> where, where, where in Michigan were you? Just started. I was, yeah, I was actually, early. when I was baptized, I was in Brighton, Michigan. But then after two years there, our that's family, we moved to Adrian, Michigan. That's hilarious. I used to live right outside of Brighton myself in a town called Whitmore Lake. Wow. <laughs> yeah. How about that? So I'm sure you know where Whitmore Lake is. Yep. Uh, I actually don't know where that is because I was in Brighton for like two years when I was like in first, oh, in first grade. <laughs> so first grade. I, so I do know where like Lock Aaron is. <laughs> context, Pat. Context. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and something I tell people, it's kind of funny in my elementary years, I actually actually went to a small Christian school in Adrian, Michigan, uh, from second grade to, to fifth grade. And I was pretty insecure in my faith. So I would, you know, in the Protestant world, there's something called the sinner's prayer, where you pray to receive Jesus in your heart. And I would pretty much every time I went to the restroom, I would just pray that because I was so insecure, like, Lord, am I saved? Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but a big moment in my conversion growing up was I and a big influence on me was summer camp. And so in fifth grade, I went to a camp called Canacuck, um, and I saw a skit of the crucifixion. And when I saw that and that just live portrayal of Jesus being crucified, I was like, okay, I, I want to follow Jesus, not just because it's my parents' faith. I want to follow him for myself. Mm-hmm. And that's really when I started getting more serious about reading the Bible and finding good accountability in my life. And so really from a young age, I've That's had this. impressive, man. So how, yeah. how old were you? Is this still around like the second grade? Uh, no, that was in fifth grade. Oh, so fifth grade. Was, but still young. That's, that's impressive. Very, yeah, very young. Mm-hmm. And that camp um, was more, a big influence on me. So they encouraged me to start reading the Bible every year. And uh, so I started doing that and growing in my faith in that way. And we, you know, growing up, I especially from sixth grade through high school, went to this big mega church, this non-denominational Baptist-based church in in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And actually in high school, I also went to a Methodist youth group and a Baptist youth group uh, just because that's where some of my friends went. So pretty serious about my my faith. And um, in college, though, I was part of, I guess, what's called a Reformed Baptist church, um, down here, a lot of people are familiar with the Village Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, mm-hmm. um, but I went to school at the University of Texas, and and um, I went to a church called the Austin Stone Community Church and led a missional community there and all that, joined a Christian fraternity called Brothers Under Christ or Bucks, and actually, it's funny because I had two Catholic friends in, in that Christian fraternity, and I would argue with them. <laughs> Um, you don't say the Catholics yeah, just, and the Protestants wanted to yeah, argue, huh? <laughs> yeah. And, and so I would just argue with them and uh, they gave me some CDs. And so that was the first time I ever heard the word Eucharist was from those CDs, but it never really clicked. And so I don't really count that as actually like learning about it. Cause I, I just kind of ignored it. Um, and also the only other time 
until a few years ago that I had gone to mass was in elementary school. And I don't remember that at all other than the jelly donuts afterwards. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't really count that as my first mass experience either. Yep. Um, but a huge thing in my college years is that I really started having this growing longing to be part of the early church, the church I saw in the book of Acts. I loved the book of Acts and the miracles and all of that. And so I actually left that church I was going to and started this house church or prayer group on campus and went through kind of a tough time in college um, spiritually. Uh, just, I mean, I was actually doing really well and then kind of fell under an attack by Satan, if you will. Uh, we, we don't need to go into that, but basically I recovered from that, got delivered from it, praise God. And after that, it, it, it was like, okay, I, I really want to learn more about the Holy Spirit. I want to learn more about the things that I had been experiencing um, kind of on the charismatic side of, of things. And once again, my heart was to be part of the early church. And so I did a discipleship training school at a charismatic uh, church in Waco called Antioch Community Church mm -hmm. and was there for a year. And uh, really something I still value to this day from that school was their, their emphasis on intimacy with Jesus Christ, like above all the charismatic gifts and the craziness that you can experience even way beyond that better than that is and foundational is, is that relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so after I got done with that school, moved back home for a time and that's really where I started questioning some things. And so instead of going to church on Sundays, I was like, okay, I just need to like figure some stuff out. So I would go to a pond actually near my parents' house and just spend time with God in nature. Cause I how, always, how, how appropriate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, I, my parents call it church at the pond. And so <laughs> I would have church by myself yep. at a pond, which now as a Catholic, I'm like, Oh my goodness, like, what have I done? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it was a necessary step on my journey though. And no, um, it's, it's same here. Right. So yeah. and, like, obviously as, as Catholics, that isn't something that like we, we look back and like heretic. Right. <laughs> right. It's just kind of funny. Like my spirituality now compared to then and just like, wow, this is, that was different. Um, yeah, same here, man. It's it is it is funny, but it's 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 also funny because, you know, I look back and uh, I'll give you some background on on yes. me too as, as we go around. But I went through a kind of very, I mean, I for many years I would have just considered myself an, an outright atheist, and then I went through a kind of wide arcing spiritual path, um, a, a study of natural theology. It was philosophy that originally brought me out of of faith and religion, and then it, as I got deeper into it, it brought me back in again. Oh wow. Um, and so I got to kind of a, a general theism, and, and from there I spent time probably best described as a religious pluralist, you know, thinking, oh, okay, maybe all religions are true or false, mm -hmm. depending how you look at it. But I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the God of the philosopher exists, at least, right? Then I started taking seriously the, the questions, the historical veracity of, of Christ and his claims, and, and that mm -hmm. moved me into sort of a mere Christianity I had every anti-Catholic bias that you can possibly imagine. I mean, when, <laughs> when you start with people like the old atheists and you just live this deeply secular life, like nothing is, is worse in the world than the Catholic church, right? So mm -hmm. like anything could have been right but that. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I, I, I start going to um, various evangelical and Lutheran congregations. And um, as I told you before we got on, I really did try to make it work. I did, but I was so <laughs> committed at the time of like, look, if this is, if this is true, if, if, if there really is truth here, like it's gotta, it's gotta connect from start to finish. I can't just kind of like get to solo scriptura and then not be able to defend that. And I just could not get that position to work. And especially as I started coming up against the Catholic objections, I'm like, <laughs> dang, I don't, I like, I don't feel like I can answer these. And I feel like I've studied the very best people in response to it. And it just seems like it's a total non-starter for me. Mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like similar to you. The funny thing is, it's so funny that you said that, that you wanted to be like the early church. Yeah. Somebody literally said that to me in, in an evangelical uh, setting. Uh, Cause I was like, okay, well, what's kind of like, you know, what do you guys believe? And she said, well, we just believe what the earliest church beliefs. I'm like, what a great question. And that started me off on a study of huh? church history. Huh. And then I just realized that John Henry Newman was right, that to, to be deep in, in history is to cease to be Protestant. So between my difficulties with Sola Scriptura and a study of church history is eventually what kind of brought me into the Catholic church. So 
my story is not important. We're focusing on you, just so you no, have. It the, is important, Pat. It really well, is. Well, it's not important because everybody here has heard it a million times, but okay. you have it. So I'm just trying to give give you to kind of yeah, because it sounds like even though we came from different starting points, we did take a similar path. So yeah. continue, please continue. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So at church at the pond, uh, I started having some conversations with God and I'd pray and read my Bible and I would come across verses like in first Peter, where it says to submit to your elders, like, Oh dang, who are my elders? And I'm not submitted to anyone right now. Uh, that's kind of convicting. Mm-hmm. But I started asking God questions. I was like, God, you know, why should I go to church? You know, if it's about worship music, I can listen to that on my iPod. If it's about some guy's sermon, I can listen to that on my iPod or a podcast. Uh, If it's about Christian community, well, I already have great Christian friends in my life. So what is it about? And kid you not, in my mind's eye flashed the word communion. And I was like, huh. And then I kind of just tucked that in the back of my mind for about a year. (laughs) Um, and continue just spending time with God at the pond. And, but a year later, uh, one of my good friends and coworkers at the time named Ethan, he, he had actually been part of that same sort of charismatic, um, church, but we weren't friends back then because he had already moved on to seminary and he went to, uh, a reformed seminary called Redeemer uh, mm-hmm. back in the day. And since going there, he had become Anglican, but was slowly, on the journey to become Catholic, you know, Anglican seems to be kind of the gateway to Catholicism. It, it does. Yeah. You know? it, it's kind of the, it's, and yeah, yeah it, it isn't because I didn't pass through that, but I see people, I think the famous example is like C.S. Lewis. Right. And I right. think his editor said like, if he just lived 10 more years, he would have finally become Catholic. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause he seemed to really like the, the, the tradition and the, but he was such an Englishman at the same time, you know, mm-hmm. he was such a patriot that I think that that, kind of, you know, definitely um, secured him in one camp for a while. Yeah. And yeah. And so just to, um, and also just to give you an idea of my kind of perspective growing up on the Catholic church, kind of, kind of like yours, but I, mine was less flagrant, I, I guess. Like I didn't realize I had that many prejudices or misconceptions of Catholicism until I started to actually dig into it and realize, oh, uh, didn't realize I had that against the Catholic church or Um, but even a few years ago before this experience I'm about to share, I, I visited the Vatican, um, on my way to Albania on a mission trip. And I, when I was there, I just thought to myself, oh, this is just like an empty religion. They don't even believe about a relationship with Jesus. That was my attitude. Like I, so I was not looking for this at all. Mm -hmm. So my friend Ethan's, uh, we're starting to have conversations and he says something to me that I'll never forget. He was like, Eric. I know your heart burns to be part of the early church, but I think I found it. It still exists. Mm. And I was like, what, what does this mean? (laughs) He told me about apostolic secession. He got me hooked on the early church fathers, their writings. And so I started to read the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who is a disciple of the apostle John. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away. I was like, Oh my goodness. Like he's talking about this thing called the Eucharist. What is that? It's apparently central to their whole life as Christians, um, because I was also reading St. Justin Martyr's stuff on that, and I was like, okay, well, I've been a Christian since first grade, and I have hardly ever even heard of this, and so this is a problem. Um, Ignatius also talks about submitting to your bishop, and I was like, oh, dang, like, who's my bishop, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And so some very uh, provoking thoughts came from studying the early church fathers, their writings, um, my patron saint ended up becoming St. Polycarp, who was also a disciple of the Apostle John, and just an amazing uh, martyrdom story that we have from him. Um, but I chose him because he's a link from the scriptures to the church tradition. And what's awesome is that you learn that there's been cons- consistency from the time of the scriptures, these early church fathers down to this day in the Catholic church and on what they teach. Isn't it incredible? I mean, that blew my mind because that was like, I was never expecting to see anything like that ever. And I started reading these guys like Clement and Ignatius and Irenaeus. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is, (laughs) this sounds Catholic. (laughs) I know. If you're like, Oh, but this can't be true, but it is. No. (laughs) But, but then that like, it blows your mind away. It's like, we have almost 2000 years of preservation of this. Like, how yep. is that even possible? 
Yeah. How, like, how is that even possible? Like, through really corrupt, fallible people, including popes, somehow these essential traditions and teachings have been preserved somehow. So that was like, that just mm-hmm. it more than nudged me, where I'm like, there's got to be something more to this church thing than just men, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. So was there any, was there any one, because the two things that got me, Eric, at least at first were two things. One was their kind of un undying and unyielding devotion to the real presence of the Eucharist. Like right. that, that you read these people and it's just undeniable that they mm-hmm. believe they didn't use the word transubstantiation, but they believed it through and through. Right. Um, and they would argue like, like they would use the Eucharist to argue against the Gnostics. Like the Eucharist was the mm-hmm. basic starting point. Like everybody knows that, that it's about the Eucharist, right? They weren't arguing for it. They were arguing against other things from the Eucharist. Like, like origin does that. I'm like, that's yep. re- like, it's so Base, it's just such a basic belief to them that – so that was really interesting. And then the other thing was just their language and talk of, of sacrifice in relation mm-hmm. to the Mass because that in, in sort of the Protestant world I was in was like – that was considered sacrilege when you mm-hmm. talk like that. And I'm like the only people that really talk like that really seem to be Catholics. Yet that's exactly how they're talking – Right at the earliest, church. those were the two right. things that that like really just slapped me across the face when I said that. But I'm curious what it was for you. Yeah, and and that's I mean that's that's right for me as well. And, and there was a disturbing thought that well, not a disturbing thought, but this thought that came into my mind uh, during this time that I was just like, you know what, I'm a 21st century American trying to read this Bible. <laughs> how in the world do I actually know what it was, what it what it means? How do I, how in the world do I know the interpretation? And so that's why, like, when I came across these early church fathers, when my friend showed me that, I was, I was hungry for it because I was like, yes, like, this is the key because I want to just, you know what, I, yeah, I have my opinions, I have that, those things, but who cares about my opinions? I want to know, like, the truth, and I want to know what was the lens that they wore, like, what did they believe? What was but, their perspective and put myself into that? Now, we're, and now here's my question for you. How committed were you to Sola Scriptura at that point? Because it seems like that's obviously breaking away from that. Now, was that something you were aware of or you just were kind of abandoning it that, at that point or what's going on? Because I, I, I find that that is such, such a deeply ingrained belief for people who were raised Protestant. Mm-hmm. That's, and like, I, don't, I don't mean anything bad by this, but I mean, like, I get it. Like, if that is like the belief that you come up with, that scripture is the, the absolute and only authority, then to even consider going outside of that, it's just like, you, you, don't, you don't even consider it. So it, for me, it wasn't that difficult because like, I tried to get into Protestant and I tried to wreck and I just could never even st- get that position started. So it wasn't difficult, I would say, for me to give that up. But yeah. I could see how somebody who's raised their entire life with that to even begin to question it a little bit could raise all kinds of alarms. Well, it's interesting because growing up as a Protestant, at least from my experience, it's not like we talked about the the three solas at all, really. It was more just like we go to church and we believe in this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We join a Bible study. We we read the Bible. We're committed to reading the Bible every day, quiet time, accountability, like those sorts of things. But we don't we didn't really dig deep, at least in the non-denominational world, um, into the, like the history of Protestantism. And like, it was just presumed, I guess, or assumed that you would believe in Sola Scriptura, even though we didn't necessarily call it that. And I also never identified myself as a Protestant. I just didn't like that word necessarily, but I was. Like, that's what I, what I was. Um, I just always would say, you know, I'm not even religious. I just follow Jesus, those sorts of things. <laughs> and and so. Yeah, I guess I just assumed that I didn't need anything else from the Bible for so long, but I guess as I as I just lived longer and and I guess these questions just started popping up and so it never was like I'm going to now go against my sola scriptura belief. It was more of just a natural evolution of thought, I guess in my mind, um similar to how my sort of anti-Catholic thoughts, they those weren't like taught to me those were just kind of air you breathe down here in texas in the bible belt yeah the air you breathe of the soul scripture even if you don't even really dig into it necessarily or even like hold on to that or grasp it it's just like what you do it's not necessarily something you really think about very much you just assume it yeah it's amazing so i mean i have many great protestant friends Mm -hmm. um, brothers and sisters and i have uh just had one of my greatest friends evangelical you know sit across from the table to me and we were hashing 
hashing some of this stuff out. Um, it was a great conversation. It was like a two and a half hour conversation, probably mm-hmm. one of my longest podcasts yet. Wow. And, um, you know, so certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because in, in my experience, I either, uh, uh, for people who are coming from that perspective, they are either very, very aware of Solus Scriptura and, and mm-hmm. very much committed to it. And my three biggest problems there are the kind of classic Jesuit, Jesuit critiques that scripture can't tell you what scripture is. There's no inspired table of content. Scripture can't tell you how to mm-hmm. interpret scripture, which is fundamentally problematic, I think. And you brought that up. You just realized that you're, yourself in your journey. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then scripture can't teach you how to apply the consequences or really teachings of scripture in a modern context. So mm-hmm. between, those, between those two things, it's just like I could not even get it off, off the ground. Um, it, so, so, yeah. and then, but then there's the other um, people I talked to, I think Aaron would probably fall more in line with this like you. Um, and I'm having him back on again too. So he can certainly speak for himself when, when we, when, when he gets there is that, uh, yeah, same thing kind of assumes it, but doesn't really maybe uh, make it explicit. Uh, but also d- wouldn't even consider himself a Protestant, um, which again, never made sense since it seems like Protestants have kind of forgotten where they've c- come from <laughs> a lot of them, right. <laughs> uh, or wouldn't even use the term religious. And in my path, like, you know, even, you know, it's very hard in philosophy, like philosophers don't actually have, um, and I'm, you're probably very familiar with this, Eric, that, like there's not really a, a really good universally accepted definition of religion. There's just, there's just mm-hmm. not, um, you know, some say, well, is it, is it a person's ultimate commitment or this or that? But the the way that I kind of thought about it is, okay, a lot of people are talking about how they, you know, have a relationship with God or Jesus. But the, the fundamental question to me, to me is, is there a way that God and Jesus want us to have a relationship to him? That, right. that seemed much more interesting and important. Not what I want, right? Like forget yeah. about what I want and my feelings, but is there a specific way that I am supposed to or commanded to or advised to, or what have you, enter into a, a relationship with God and, and Christ. And obviously, I, I think I found my answer to that within the Catholic yeah. Church. But I'm, I'm just curious, because you, I don't even know what I'm, the point I'm making here. But I'm kind of curious, you know, what, what your perspective on, on even the term religion is coming from your Protestant perspective. <laughs> well, I would always tell people, you know, kind of going along with the Book of James, that true religion is remaining unstained from the world and taking care of what is an orphans in their distress. And so I would always come back to just, Hey, that's, that's what religion is. But I don't, other than that definition, I don't believe in a religion. I believe in a relationship with, with Christ. But now as a Catholic, it's like, well, um, it's all those things, but it's also, it's just the way that we commune with God. It's the way he set up for us to have that, that relationship with him. And so it's, it just gets a bad name, like a, you know, bad rap, like this religion word or things like authority and like hierarchy, like gets really in our culture. Those are like cuss words almost. Oh and yeah. They're, they're dirty words. They're dirty they, words. They, but they really to me, uh-huh. authority is what really attracted me to the Catholic church because I was like, you know, I'm 20, like I said, I'm 21st century American. How do I know I need a reliable source? And so it was my hunger for the early church that drove me in this direction. And the irony is that all those churches that I'd been a part of that were so adamant about being the church in the book of Acts and being part of the early church. And like, that was the emphasis. So that was in me from those experiences. Well, they never even mentioned St. Ignatius of Antioch. They never even mentioned St. Justin Martyr. It's like, it's like, well, we wanted to be part of the early church, but we actually had no idea what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how could you, honestly, how could you yeah. mention them? Because as soon as I don't see how anybody can re, like they're so explicit and so direct oh, yeah. Yeah. that I don't see how anybody can can read and study these early church mm-hmm. fathers and really not come away with at least a sacramental view, yeah, um, and a hierarchical, visible, unified church. But but all of that has just described mm-hmm. the Catholic Church. <laughs> and I will say this that um, I think my Protestant background was really a preparation for my conversion into Catholicism especially in the sense that, like I said, in the discipleship train school, that emphasis on that intimate relationship with Christ. Well, once I found out about the Eucharist and I was like, oh, dang, like that's, that's intimacy with, with God, like mm. par excellence. Like that is, oh my goodness. So that's something I share with my, my Protestant friends is like, guys, like, listen, we, we always believed that it was about this thing. And, and actually I, I just discovered that it, 
there's more, like there's so much more intimacy to be had than we even thought. And kind of my perspective though, on the Catholic church was similar to the Pharisees about Nazareth. Like, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of the Catholic church? And once I found out about the Eucharist, I was like, yes, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. came out of that i love i love it oh dang <laughs> oh dang it's a, well i mean it was this, it was the same you know um experience for me um mm-hmm. I, like i said so part of my story is after i i felt like i had kind of like intellectually assented to catholicism like i feel like i, I worked it out i'm like okay this this seems true to me i need mm-hmm. you know god i need a sign you know and yep. I, I i i prayed and that that night, I got just this like utter instigation to just attend a Catholic mass. It was actually Christmas Eve, okay. Um, so I just got in my car and I went. And the closest thing that I've ever had to any type of spiritual or mystical experience in my life was um, was the, during the consecration of the host. Like I just I felt it that like wow. what, like God is with us right now. Um, mm-hmm. So that was like the movement of the, the the heart or the soul that that I needed mm-hmm. to accompany my sort of intellectual yeah. conversion at that point. And you know, I'm not I'm not a big like feelings guy at all. Like mm-hmm. I don't I don't typically have that those experiences. So the fact that I actually had something like that. Um, in the context, I think is important, um, mm-hmm. kind of spoke to me in a way that I feel like I, I actually haven't ever been spoken to like mm-hmm. that before. So really interesting. So I want to go back a little bit, Eric, because I always think it's interesting. You say you just kind of assumed a lot of kind of anti-Catholic biases mm-hmm. or stereotypes. What were some of those uh, misconceptions yeah. that you had and how did you end up clearing, clearing those up? Because I'm sure maybe a lot, a lot of people might hold the very same thing. So it could be helpful to unpack some yeah. of that. Well, for one, um, it was the belief that it was just an empty religion and that they didn't believe in a relationship with Christ. And a huge thing, by the way, that helped me overcome probably the main thing besides the early church fathers was actually my friend also encouraged me to read the catechism of the Catholic Church. So just reading that, I was like amazed. I I was blown away at the beauty of the way it was able to describe the, the teachings of the faith. And that really cleared up a lot of these misconceptions and also revealed to me what some of my misconceptions were. So um, the very first paragraph after the prologue, or sorry, after the preface, is one of the best summaries of the gospel I've ever heard. So I highly encourage your listeners to check out the catechism, of course, and read that. And it talks about being in relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And how, and it also says in the catechism, like the very end goal of the divine economy is unity of, cre- of creatures with the Trinity. Mm-hmm. And, and so learning that, wow, they, they do value that. So that's a big thing. My number one hurdle, though, I'll tell you, and I tell people this, is my number one hurdle was all that Mary stuff. Mm, mm-hmm. um, I, I probably did think, I, I don't know if I explicitly said this, but I thought in the back of my mind that Catholics worshipped Mary. Mm-hmm. Or at the very least, I didn't understand why in the world they honored her at all. Yep. Like, why did they emphasize her at all? Isn't that just distracting from Jesus? Mm-hmm. And um, and so that was a huge thing. And and so my sponsor, my the guy who's discipling me, once I started RCIA, RCIA back in 2014, um, he gave me a little apologetics book on Mary. And I was like, I need to see where this is in scripture. Um, which, by the way, the whole scripture thing, that was definitely a misconception. I thought Catholics didn't believe in the scripture, didn't read it or whatever, didn't know the scriptures. When I first went to Mass that summer in 2014, I was blown away by how much scripture I heard. I heard more scripture in that Mass than I'd ever heard in any Protestant church as far as like just hearing the Bible. I was like, what? It felt like I was taking a bath in scripture and it was awesome. <laughs> I loved it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, so I was like, I need to see where Mary is in scripture. Cause all I see is that Jesus doesn't really care too much about her. You know, like who, who are my mothers? Who are my brothers? These are my true mothers and brothers. Those who do the will of my father or woman, what does this have to do with me at the wedding feast of Cana? And so, um, but really learning that Jesus used this type of method of reading the scriptures when he was on the road to Emmaus, where he uncovers the old Testament shows the disciples where he is. And then Paul uses that as well when he calls Jesus the new Adam. And so started learning about this thing called typology Mm -hmm. where you 
see these Old Testament events and people as prefigurations of their New Testament fulfillments. Yep. Once I learned that the early church, like St. Polycarp, so St. Polycarp was a disciple of John, and St. Polycarp discipled St. Irenaeus, and St. Yep. Irenaeus is the one who said, the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. Mm-hmm. And so the early church thought, okay, if Jesus is the new Adam, then Mary is the new Eve. Mm-hmm. And so then I was like, okay, well, that actually then makes sense of dogmas like the Immaculate Conception, because a, a rule in typology is that the New Testament fulfillments are way greater than their Old Testament prefiguration. It can't be less than the old and the new. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if the old Eve was born without original sin and then fell into sin, how much more the new Eve needs to be born without original sin and then remain sinless? Like it just... Like it's typologically it just has to be the way the, the case. And it's a preparation for her role, obviously, as being mother of God. She's still saved by Christ, but preemptively. And what I would say about the, all the quote unquote Mary stuff, the Catholics believe, well, I would say, I would say two things. One is once you actually start to take it seriously and really study it. And there's so many great books on there. Uh, I mean, Scott Hahn obviously has great stuff. Brant Petrie has a new book out on it that, that I haven't got to dive too deep in, but I'm looking forward to. It gives you such an elevated view of the divine masterpiece of salvation. Oh, yes. Such an elevated view that only actually makes sense once you like, under, like, of course God would do it this way. He's God. Why would he do it anything less? <laughs> right, right. And, and, and so, you know, there's that. It just gives you such a deeper appreciation of truly God's masterwork at play um, and, and for scripture in general. When you, when, you, when, you can, when you read the new in light of the old, the old in light of the new, and you see Mary's role and why Catholics venerate her, do not worship, yeah. venerate. Um, the, but the other thing was, obviously, I wasn't trying to work out like every Mary position before I became Catholic. So for mm-hmm. me, it was like, what are the critical questions I need to answer to assent to this, like mm-hmm. firmly? And it's the same thing with like, Christianity in general. It's like, okay, I could maybe try and spend time on figuring out like who Adam and Eve were historically. I don't know if that's going to be very fruitful Mm -hmm. or or Noah's Ark, but it seems to me like if I have good evidence for the resurrection, then I can fully and and totally assent to this, even if I still have other questions, right? Like Mm -hmm. that, that's the hinge point. Well, same thing with the Catholic church. It's like, there's a, there's, it's 2000 years of history. Like that's, there's no way anybody's going to be able to work all, through all that stuff in any type of lifetime. So if you're putting off becoming Catholic till you get an answer to every question, I think you're going to just, you're just going to, you're going to be dead. You're going to be dead. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and questions are not arguments, <laughs> right? Either. Um, so for me, for the Catholic church, I was like, well, if I have good reason that Christ left us with a church, that there's a primacy to a church than there is even to scripture. Mm-hmm. And I have good reason to believe that that church was hierarchical, visible, unified, and sacramental. In other words, if I have good reason to believe that the Catholic church really is God's church, then I can assent to it. I can trust in it in the same way that I can trust in Christ if the resurrection is true. And that's kind of what I did. I'm like, okay, maybe I don't get all the Mary stuff at first, but mm-hmm. it seems like I have all the justification I need to believe that this, this really is the place I need to be. And I can mm-hmm. figure it out later. I can, I can approach it with an open mind. So, th- so that's what I did because same thing. I was, yeah. I was skeptical. I, I didn't get it at first, but then once I started to get into it, oh my goodness, the, the right. enrichment is mm-hmm. just so fantastic. Um, so that was, you know, again, sorry to hijack here, but that oh, was kind of how, right. how I approached some of the Mary stuff that was helpful for me because Again, I think in any religious discussion, whether it's about God's existence or Christianity in general or Catholicism in particular, there's a million questions mm-hmm. and paths you could possibly go on. But there's always those like few fundamental hinge points that if you can just answer those, yeah. you kind of have everything you need to move forward, even if you exactly. still have a ton of questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for me, like I, the the most basic thing I needed to know from the Catholic Church was I needed to hear explicitly from them the source like the from the catechism that they do not worship mary mm-hmm. and fortunately i heard that um <laughs> it's right fact, there <laughs> you don't mind I, i'd like to read this brief paragraph yep in the catechism uh paragraph 971 because this was just huge like i remember reading this and i was like yes thank you lord <laughs> and it says this all generations will call me blessed the church's devotion to the blessed virgin is intrinsic to christian worship The church rightly honors the Blessed Virgin with special devotion. From the most ancient times, the Blessed Virgin has been honored with the title of Mother of God, to whose protection the faithful fly in all their dangers and needs. This very special devotion differs essentially 
from the adoration which is given to the incarnate word and equally to the father and the holy spirit and greatly fosters this adoration and so and then learning about those three greek words dulia hyperdulia and latria and how latria is worship and that's what we give to god and god alone Mm -hmm. dulia is honor that we give to saints and hyperdulia is the highest form of honor we can give to a creature uh, which is given to mary because she's mother of god but i love that paragraph because it explicitly says that devotion is is different like it's different than this adoration this worship that we give to god but it actually fosters that that worship well the the kind of funny thing is that you know people could still disagree i suppose even if we should we should venerate mary or not but it but what should stop happening is this misconception and confusion that catholics are worshiping mary like that right, just right. that just isn't the case and it's funny because uh, like you another shared experience here um when i was uh at a sort of evangelical service um the pastor was just railing into into catholics like just like just railing and 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 kind of saying well catholics believe this and catholics believe that the typical work stuff right like you kind of right. gotta get like your tally marks to get into heaven and i'm like that just sounds so odd to me that sounds so bizarre like i want to look that up and then i went and got the catholic catechism and i quickly discovered well that isn't what catholics believe at all <laughs> he just he just got it complete and that's right the- that's the funny and great thing about the Catholic faith is you can just get the catechism. You can walk into pretty much any parish and yeah. you'll be able to get it for free. If you want, you can get it zipped over on Amazon even. <laughs> I think on Amazon, it's got like 3,000 like really good reviews. It's just funny <laughs> to see the catechism being reviewed. It's a great book, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that, I mean, it was so clarifying for me because I'm hearing all these attacks And I'm not saying that there aren't any, like, Mm -hmm. good, accurate, substantive objections to Catholicism. There are, and and we obviously have to be able to work through those or respond to them. But the vast majority of all the stuff that I personally believe and I was hearing were just total misconceptions, total mischaracterizations, that just a brief skimming through the catechism just immediately cleared away. Yeah, and, I mean, you mentioned the the works thing, and I actually had – it was last summer. There was these two um, friends of mine who are Protestant. They we had just met at the time, and so we want they wanted to go to lunch and just kind of ask questions. And they really had that as I was describing the sacramental life of the church. You know how we, you know the efficacious nature of baptism and how awesome baptism is, and then confirmation, the Eucharist, confession all these means of grace is why I told him these are means of grace. And so to me and what the church teaches is that the sacramental life is actually the life of grace par excellence. It's actually the life of the torn veil par excellence because we actually get to see and be with Jesus in the Eucharist and grace himself comes into us. And so God always initiates the grace. We then cooperate with that grace. And so to me, it's centered on Jesus and it is, completely grace filled more grace than i'd ever experienced in my whole life so <laughs> it's crazy and, and it may- i have that same misconception that it, oh it's all about the rules and all this law stuff and you know you just gotta check it off the list and it's like no these are this is god encountering you and like him wanting to just pour him whole his whole self to you to, to just love you and you just respond in that love as well. And so it's, yes. it's the life of grace. It is. It's, it's a relationship. It really yeah. fundamentally is. It's about getting as, the most possible help you can from God right? and, and accepting it and responding to it and cooperating. So it, it has a very high view, and I would say proper view, of, of the role of human free will as well, right? which was a big thing for me because as I was going through different sort of Protestant, oh, you know, tulip and calvinism and 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 their kind of denial of human free will a lot of us like well what the hell is the point <laughs> quite frankly <laughs> you know what i mean right. <laughs> so but yet the, the catholic church somehow beautifully affirms god's you know god's constant instigation of us without mm-hmm. without being coercive and how we, we are able to enter into a love loving saving relationship with him uh to receive his grace but we still have a role we still have a role to play right. 
we still, you know, we still have a responsibility. And that's what works is about is that acceptance. Grace comes first. We don't earn it. We yep. don't earn any of that thing, but we, ha- we do have a role in our human free will to respond to it, to accept it, to exactly. cooperate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, quite frankly, that devotion to Mary actually does play that pivotal role because she cooperated with the grace that God initiated amazingly. And so she can help us actually live that life of cooperation and produce those good works. And so it all fits together. And that's the thing. Once you see like the whole picture, it's like, oh, this all makes sense. Um, And it's beautiful. It's like a beautiful tapestry, if you will. Um, But it takes a lot. Like it, it's, I mean, even just from my experience, like it's huge paradigm shifts, but like one, like you said, like once a one domino falls, um, for, you know, really it's that authority piece. Once you realize that as scripture says that the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. And wow. Once you see that the early church believe these things has been consistent. And I came to the point where it's like, okay, if I don't believe this, I'm disagreeing with all the saints that have gone before me and all the councils and like, <laughs> who am I to do that? Like, that is so prideful of me. Like I need to just humble myself and say, yep, this is it. And I want my lens, I want my actions and my life to be shaped into this mold so that I can better glorify God with my life. Like, it's just like, and it's not, it's it's a beautiful form of submission. I know that's another yes. curse word in our culture, but like for me, submission to to the proper authority, to the proper way, like once you find out, like this is just, God knows what's best for me. I don't even know what's best for me. And he- yep. He yeah, allows- we're not talking about the we're right. not talking about Kim Jong Il here, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> this is something that like I I can trust. Like, okay, you look at all these holy men and women that have gone before us. You know, Mother Teresa. Okay, she believed this. Saint John Paul II believed this. Um, you know, you go on and on. Saint Francis of Assisi, Saint Augustine. Most people love Saint Augustine. Well, he believed all this. Mm-hmm. Saint Thomas Aquinas, or um, even before Saint Augustine, you got Saint Cyprian, Saint. Irenaeus, like all these guys, and you're just like, it's cohesive, it's harmonious, it's, and I want to be part of it. You know what? I don't care about my former <laughs> misconceptions anymore. I just want to jump right in and mm. um, let's do this thing. Like, I want to be a saint like them, like ultimately, and and becoming part of the thing they were doing, and and the same Eucharist that they received is now the same Eucharist I receive. It's Jesus Christ, Christ mm-hmm. in you, the hope of glory, and wow, like. Okay, so I'm now in the place where God can just like pour out his grace even more abundantly uh, through these means that he himself has established in Christ Jesus. So it's it's a beautiful thing. Man, that is beautiful, Eric. I mean, glory glory to God, man. I love the passion you bring to this too. I, <laughs> I could sit here and talk to you for hours, but unfortunately I have a Latin mass I have to get to here. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> yeah, so we just moved to uh, to the Milwaukee area. We're just kind of exploring all the cool parishes around. But um, I'm going to have you back on because I want to uh, probably, awesome. uh, probably a lot of times if I can bother you about it uh, <laughs> because there's, there's so many more paths I want to take on this. But before before we wrap this part one up, I want to make sure that we mention all the cool stuff you're working on so people can go go deeper with that. So tell us about your podcast, tell us about your book, and tell us the best places for people to connect with you. Yes, and I just want to throw a bomb out there real quick before I mention that. Uh, my parents, my mom and my dad became Catholic last year. Oh. So it's awesome. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so maybe next time we can talk about that. Yeah, that'd be a great picking up. Um, one. I'd, I'd yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so I wrote a book called Thoughts of a Changed Mind, Letters from Father to Son. And I wrote that during my conversion experience. So I started writing actually as I was about to enter the Catholic Church in 2015, and then finished writing it that same year. And so it really is, it's not just about my um, Catholic faith. It's really, well, it's about my spiritual journey overall. And obviously, that Catholic conversion plays a huge role. And so I wrote it I'm, I'm not married and don't have kids right now. And so um, it's fictional context. But I, I was like, you know, if I was to die, like these are the things that I would want the world to know about like what God has taught me. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote it as if I was a dad to my son. And so it's a very, um, it's an intimate setting to write uh, to your son. And so it's a very easy thing to read and they're short letters, but it covers a lot of things, both just practical wisdom for everyday life and then also, um, but but centered on Jesus Christ and spirituality there. And then part three of it, there's nine parts, is my conversion to Catholicism. And 
some of those paradigm shifts. And so, but recently I, um, I actually just finished writing my second book and I'm really excited about that. I'm not quite ready to share about it. Um, it is about the sacraments. I, that's all I'll say. Mm. Um, but I'm in the publishing process now and trying to get things going with that. But I did just start a podcast and YouTube channel called Polycarp's Paradigm. So would love for, for you all to, to check that out. And, um, you know, actually, I did share my story on there in episode three. It's about an hour long. So you get more of my story. And then I really took the month of May. And I'm taking the month of May to, to go over those things about Mary. Uh, so oh, Very cool. Very um, cool. And I do some teaching now at my parish um, for RCIA. I actually teach on Mary and the Saints and Baptism and Confirmation the Eucharist as well. And um, and then actually, I just released this week on my podcast my interview with my my mom. So I interviewed her about her spiritual journey. How about she, that, that's fantastic. I, yeah. I get. I need to have my mom on now. <laughs> yeah, she grew up Christian Scientist actually. Oh wow, little Mary uh, Baker Eddy going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. She's like, she was saying, fortunately, her mom didn't come become Christian science till after she had her vaccinations. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, thankfully. Um, thankfully. But, and then I'll have my dad on. I already interviewed him, but I'll air that interview in, uh, around Father's Day. And so anyway, cool. check out Polycarp's Paradigm. You can buy my book on Amazon or lulu.com. Um, is, I'm, going, I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to link all that in the show notes for everybody perfect, perfect. so they can, they can grab all that. And uh, Eric, we, we have a lot to pick up on on next time. Yes, thank, yes. Thank you so much, man, for taking the time and joining me. This has been just absolutely fascinating. I love it. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood, on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.